This episode is sponsored by Audible. Get a free audiobook of your choice that you get to keep with their free trial. You can learn more at lutherancartographer.com slash audible. The Lutheran Cartographer, episode 59. Welcome to The Lutheran Cartographer, the podcast where we explore what it's like to be Lutheran in different places. I'm your host, Nicholas Weber. Today we are going to Cheyenne, Wyoming to talk to Pastor Joshua Shear. He is the senior pastor of Our Savior Lutheran Church in Cheyenne. Pastor Shear, welcome to the show. Glad to be here. Help orient our listeners geographically. We're in Wyoming, in Cheyenne. Where exactly is that for those that aren't as familiar with Wyoming? All right. So, so first of all, Wyoming's one of those nice square states. Uh, it's south of Montana and north of Colorado, and, and we're west of Nebraska, okay? Um, so uh, to our west is, is Utah and Idaho, depending upon where you are in the state. Um, Cheyenne is in the far southeast corner of Wyoming. So uh, I am right now about 12 miles from the Colorado border. And so that's where Cheyenne is. Uh, Cheyenne's the capital city of Wyoming. Um, so it's it's the main center of state government. And we also host a, uh, a very large uh, Air Force base, which is notable because it uh, it's an Air Force base without a runway, uh, because out here... The big thing is the missile silos, and so one of the three major missile commands for our country is is here in Cheyenne. So that's where we're at, out in the west. All right, good deal. Give our listeners a little bit of your background. Where were you before you came to Cheyenne? All right, so I came to Cheyenne in about 2011. Uh, prior to that, I was in far northern Minnesota where I served my first parish. Um, we were in a circuit that bordered Canada. So we were far northern Minnesota in a little town called Bagley. Uh, and prior to that, my vicarage, I was a delayed vicar, they call it, which means you just go out the last year of your education and get your vicarage, your internship that way. And that was in uh, southern Wisconsin, Beloit, Wisconsin. Prior to that, I lived in Fort Wayne uh, at seminary. And then prior to that, I had lived, uh, well, I'd lived in Sioux Falls, South Dakota, and then Vermilion, South Dakota, which is right down on the border with Nebraska and not far from Iowa and southeastern South Dakota. But I grew up mainly in a, in a small t- outside a small town in southwestern Minnesota. Uh, and then I went to my undergraduate in, in, in Mankato, Minnesota, in south central Minnesota. So, so mostly Midwestern stuff until I got out here to Cheyenne, which is considered Western. Great. So what kind of contrast would you draw between the places you've been and where you are now? Yeah, so the the West is definitely a different culture than the Midwest. The, the Midwest is what I grew up with, you know, where I'd served for, for schools and, and where I'd served for parishes and so forth. And then getting out here to the West, it is a little bit different. Um, people in the West are a little more relaxed. Um, the, the Midwest, you know, it tries to get everything done on time and so forth. The West is just a little bit more relaxed, a little more laid back about that. Um, but yet there's also the same and maybe even more sense of independence, uh, self-reliance, freedoms, these kind of things. You've got the mountains out here, so you got a lot of lot of nature and outdoors stuff. And then, you, of course, you have the traditions of the cowboys and, and all the things like that, the mining culture. And, yeah, so it just kind of lends towards this kind of individualism and, and just emphasis on, on liberty and freedom, so... So the people just are kind of used to being able to do their own thing. And so that's kind of a difference in mentality versus the Midwest maybe has a little more mindset of community and, and interconnectedness and so forth between people. That makes sense. Now, you just talked about how the West is more laid back. How does that come out or where do you see that? Uh, I think you see it in, in, in uh, maybe like sometimes you see it in punctuality. Sometimes like maybe deadlines, people are a little less less stringent about those kind of things. Um, it, 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 on the other side of the coin, so so it's not like just people aren't doing their work or anything, but it, on the other side of the coin, it also uh, gives itself to a level of patience amongst the people as well. Hmm. So there's just kind of the, the greater patience for each other uh, on the other side of that coin. And so you see that 
Um, you know, go to a restaurant. It's not going to be rush, rush, rush. You know, they expect it to take some time. It's okay. You know, it's time to talk, time to converse, whatever, you know. Um, and, and that kind of shows through that just kind of the pace of life is a little bit slower than maybe, uh, especially more than the coasts. But even, I think even you know, pace of life is a little, even a little slower than the Midwest. That's really interesting that you say that. The moment you talked about the restaurants, I I realized why I was feeling impatient when I was in a restaurant in Pierre, South Dakota at a steakhouse. And now that you say that, like it makes perfect sense. Yeah. That, I tell you, when, when we first moved out here in 2011, it was, it was one of the first things that just struck you is when you went out to eat, it wasn't snap, snap, snap. You know, you, you actually – it, it would kind of be a little bit different to your Midwestern sensibilities. And it was just like, what's going on? You know? And then after a while you just realize this is just what is normal and people are good with that. And as time goes on, you learn to appreciate it and take advantage of the time and, and kind of not be so uh, on top of things all the time. So that's good. Definitely. Pastor Sheer, what would you say are some of the best things about being in Cheyenne? Well, by far, the, the first thing, of course, has to be the fact that, you know, as far as, far as the town goes, um, we, we, have, uh, we have three great um, LCMS churches here in town, and we all work together really well, um, which is kind of notable as well, that a lot of times, sometimes you get, you get churches of the same denomination, the same town, and it's kind of like a competition thing, and it really hasn't been in Cheyenne, which is great. Um, but then as far as you get into like the other things of life, you know, the, the first thing has to be the state capital. So as we're talking right now, about two miles from my house is the state capital and all the legislature is in session right now. You know, they, they meet for a couple months and we're right now in the middle of that. And so they're, you know, two miles from their house, they're debating issues of taxation and revenue generation and various other measures, uh, social, moral things. Um, so that that's there, which means it lends itself to the architecture of the town and kind of the mindset so that the, the town has a, has a real professionalism to it. So it's not just a, a cattle town anymore. It's not just a, a mining town, but it has a real professionalism to it. There, there are people who live here specifically because of their professions, because of relation to the state capital. So it's, it's just it, it, it kind of creates this, this general improvement in the whole town to just have the capital being here. There's different professional offerings. Uh, you know, I-80 here is a, is a conduit for uh, for the, the large trunks of, of data fibers for like the internet. So computing has become increasingly more. There's like a, a Microsoft supercomputing center here. And so some of the tech jobs are starting to move here and, and which has brought in its own kind of professionalism, but then it also brings in uh, that culture with it. And so you're seeing the downtown is being renovated and and different mom and pop shops are popping up and, and the kind of the foodie culture is growing and like the music scene is growing. And so there's lots of neat cultural things happening. And then you have kind of the old culture too still. So we got the railroad depot, which is this gorgeous um, train station. Uh, that is in downtown, and it's just, you know, it's beautiful to go in and look at it, um, to see the railroad still running, you know, Union Pacific is still based, uh, running a lot of stuff out of here. And then uh, you also then have the still the cowboy culture. And so if you're interest, interested in that kind of cowboy Western culture, you still can find museums and shops. And then, you know, there's giant rodeos uh, here, the largest one coming up, you know, Frontier Days in July. And uh, just... Uh, all kinds of neat things in that respect. Good deal. Let's talk about the flip side. What are some of the challenges about being in Cheyenne? Yeah, so so being out here in the West can sometimes be kind of isolating, especially, I mean, as I speak as a Midwesterner. You know, in the Midwest, you kind of could figure on driving places and it wouldn't be that bad, you know. But you just you just start realizing how far West you are when you start configuring, like, what kind of driving time it would be to get to Chicago, and, and what kind of drive time it would be to, you know, go back to the seminary for a little while or something like that to go visit something or to listen to a speaker or a conference or something like that. And then, of course, you tie in the family life that, you know, uh, being of, of the Midwest, um, my wife's family is also Midwestern, although 
Um, my father-in-law is a pastor down in Texas now. So it's just, you know, if we're going to go see family, we better plan for at least 12 hours in a car. So that, that, that kind of is the, the challenge to living out here. The other challenge that can happen, and, and it's, you know, beginning to happen again, is that uh, much of the state of Wyoming is still very dependent on the mining industry. Mm. And so, like, as coal and oil and natural gas become out of vogue for our country and indeed, you know, tainted things that no one wants to touch anymore, and yet they still want the power and the, all the stuff that those things can make. It has a pretty dramatic impact on the state. The state can sometimes have a boom and bust economy, and so that that can be a a hindrance. Uh, that there's some instability there, and uh, yeah, I would say also you know just Cheyenne um, for being the capital city. It, it's only sixty thousand people, and it's the largest city in, in Wyoming. Uh, so a lot of times, you know, Wyoming and Cheyenne are both just kind of overlooked for, you know, more predominant, larger, you know, cities and, and urban areas. But sometimes that's actually a good thing. So it goes both ways. That makes sense. So it sounds like then the the commodity prices really affect life in the state then. Yeah, the, the ability of, of oil prices and so forth, and then the various regulations uh, that happen, uh, whether it's uh, regulations for you know EPA stuff or executive orders or things like that, they can really take a toll really quick on the state. So, just something that everybody's kind of always paying attention to. That makes sense. Let's go on and talk about what it's like to be Lutheran in Wyoming. So, being a Lutheran in Wyoming is is a great thing, because being a Lutheran anywhere is a great thing. Uh, Amen. You, you have this great, right. I mean, you just have this treasure and it's just like, it's yours. You didn't earn it, but here it is now, you know, confess it. And and it's a, it's a theology that's robust. It takes on all the situations of life. You can meet somebody who's a Mormon and you can discuss theology with them because, you know, they're just out to, they're out to lunch on some of these things. And, and you know, you're sharing the truth with them. They're kind of maybe having light bulbs go off and you're just like, huh, you know, or you can, you can run across an old Roman Catholic and, debate some of the same topics of the Reformation. And yeah, so being a Lutheran is just great. Now, being a Lutheran in Wyoming is also um, incredibly, uh, an incredible blessing. It's no secret that in the Missouri Synod, there's a great diversity of things. Uh, diversity of beliefs, diversity of practices is probably how most people would see it. And, and the Wyoming district is a district um, which includes the panhandle of Nebraska, uh, they needed those congregations to get the minimum <laughs> congregations to form their own district. So, uh, you know, it's a smaller district. But because of that, and because of kind of the conservative bent of the people of Wyoming, you have just kind of this natural tendency to conservative theology. And so the district is a very conscientious district about its confession of the faith, but then also about the practices of the faith. Um it's a, it's a growing thing in the Missouri Center that's great that there's a thing called visitation. Well, Wyoming District led the way in that, in restoring that practice, because Wyoming District has had visitation for decades. And what that means is, you know, circuit visitors and, and vice, district vice presidents and district president, you know, they come and visit your parish. And it's not just a, hey, how's, how's it going this morning? But they actually come, they observe, they, they talk to the congregational leadership, and they talk to them about practices, and they talk to them about doctrine, and then they sit down and they, they interview the pastors, and they talk about the practices of the congregation. They talk about, you know, the doctrine of the pastors. They, they review your sermons at times, you know, that the, there's just a real conscientious nature in the district, which that sounds like, oh man, they must be really strict, but it, but it bears fruit in that our congregations amongst the district are in agreement with each other, um, as members move around the state and transfer around the state, they encounter similar practices everywhere. There's there's not like a great offensive practice happening in one place versus another. You don't have to go go around that and kind of start talking about the diversity that, you know, really shouldn't be there, but for some reason our Senate has it. Okay. So it's a real blessing that way. Um, here in Cheyenne, you know, like I said, we have we have three congregations, a great congregations. 
Um, the, the historic congregation downtown is uh, Trinity, and they have a parochial school that they operate, K through 8, and I think they're getting ready to, to expand into a high school. And then uh, we are one of the daughter plants of that congregation at Our Savior. Um, we're the largest congregation in the, in the, amongst the Lutheran congregations in our, in our city, and I think we might be amongst the district. Um, and then there's another congregation, King of Glory, which is this uh, great congregation, it's a little smaller, but yet, you know, they, they have these pastors who, you know, all the pastors are just devoted to taking care of their members, and, and they're incredibly conscientious, which means in the community, we get the reputation of being churches that really care for their members. Um, so, which means, you know, I can be at the hospital and, and they know you versus they don't know the Roman Catholic priests because they don't go visit. Hmm. Um, you know, uh, I can be known for spending time with my members and praying with them and so forth. Whereas I've, you know, the, the, the mega church type, you know, I, I don't know if I want to call a mega church in Cheyenne, the bigger churches, uh, that try to mimic that mega church mentality, they get known for, you know, stop and quick stop by somebody and say, hey, and that's about the, the equivalent of their visit, you know, to somebody who's in need. And so so we gain this reputation of being these kind of uh, Christians who, who take great care and, and go to great lengths to care for our members and and so forth. Um, I know both, uh, the, we have two funeral homes in town and they both praise the Lutheran pastors for how much care we take in, in terms of the members who are grieving and the families and helping plan funerals and get everything right and making sure that it's done rightly. And, and it actually, you know, helps because it brings actually the, the gospel to people. And, and so there's, there's that great stuff. Um, we're kind of overshadowed by the Roman Catholics um, and also the Mormons. So you have to get used to discussing theology with those who uh, are, are still Christian and yet still have some semblance of works and so forth. But then you also have to be prepared to discuss theology with those who aren't Christians and yet would still say they are mm. and have some very strange, you know, doctrines and beliefs. And you kind of have to just lead them back to the scriptures and continue to, to work with them on that. Church members are, are just great folks. Cheyenne's uh, has a lot of in and out um, people for state government, people for the Air Force Base, various other things. We have a we have a VA hospital, uh, which goes along with the base, obviously, really well. So we have a lot of retired military and then a lot of current military active duty. And uh, so there's just a lot of things going on all the time. And, and we just kind of have these conservative underlying underpinnings, though, which is really, really helpful um, as a Lutheran, especially. Yeah, absolutely. I want to clarify something you said just a moment ago. You said that the Lutherans were overshadowed by the Roman Catholics and Mormons. You mean in terms of numbers? Yeah, it's certainly in terms of numbers, but also in terms of influence. Oh, I see. Um, um, but yeah, predominantly numbers. I mean, the uh, the Mormons have set up their houses all over the town, and they, they keep talking about building new ones over here, over there. And, you know, they put on big PR campaigns about how family values and so forth they are and, and, and all the various things attached with that. And yeah. So you just, you just learn to run into them and you, you learn to, you know, expect to see uh, two guys with white shirts and a black tie walking around and, you know, you just, you just get used to seeing that and, and talking to folks about it. And, you know, as a pastor, when you, when you get a former Mormon, it just takes a little longer to catechize them. You know, there, there's some, there's some real, deprogramming that needs to happen. Yeah. Um, which is which is its own challenge as a pastor. I mean that's that's not not normally what we what we do, but yet you kinda have to learn how to do it. That makes sense. Let's take a moment for a word from our sponsor. Folks, if you like podcasts, you will enjoy Audible. It's a service that gives you a audiobook to listen to each month of your choice from a large library. And they want to get you started with a free trial offer that includes an audiobook that you get to keep. So go to lutherancartographer.com slash audible to get your free audiobook and start your free trial today. 
If you're looking for a book to check out, I'd recommend looking at Martin Luther's Table Topics, all sorts of wit, levity, but also good, solid theological insights from Luther as well. Check it out at lutherancartographer.com slash audible. Let's get back to the show. I want to talk a little bit more about the the general religious atmosphere in Cheyenne. You mentioned before that it's a, a pretty conservative state. Interestingly, these days, conservative doesn't always mean also having a kind of Christian ethos. Would you say that the, the town kind of has that, like you might see in, say, the southeast, or is it more of a secular conservatism? Well, I've seen I've seen the secular conservatism rise. Um, it certainly is becoming more and more common to have people who are conservative who have no Christian identity whatsoever, um, and and that's that's its own thing. I mean, so I mean, in the history of the West, you know, some people came west because they they were kind of outcasts, societal kind of outcasts, and so the Wild West, you know, that that this happens, you know, the, the all the rumors of the Wild West, and so you see some of that still in in Cheyenne and the kind of Western mindset too. Um, so, so you do end up with kind of a secular conservatism at times, um, and uh, I guess you just you just work with that and use maybe that that morality that they're they're espousing to speak to them of well why is it we have this morality you know what how how is this so commonplace amongst us that we just kind of know right and wrong and you know who who is it possibly that's given us this and then of course you can move into well have you have you really actually kept this you know. It's good to it's good to profess morality and it's good to try to practice it, but in reality, do you practice it all the time? And so, that, that leads to some in, interesting conversations at times. Certainly, let's go on and talk about what it's like to raise a family in Cheyenne. So, raising a family in Cheyenne is is um, something that well we've been doing for the last ten years. Um, my wife Holly and I, we have four kids. Uh, right now, ranging in age from 16 down to 8. And uh, so raising kids in town has been a good experience because um, you do have that kind of patient and laid-back mentality in some respects. That's been very helpful to teach my children patience and, and to appreciate, you know, the moment and, and to not be insisting upon the future right now and so forth, which has been helpful. Uh, but the conservatism has also been helpful. Um it's also been really good to be in the capital city. So my my kids are familiar with the capital. They're familiar with you know all the beautiful architecture and and especially the interior. They just they just spent a bunch of money three years ago redoing the whole capital, and it's just this gorgeous woodwork. They uh, the capital got renovated back to what it had been prior to the 1960s and 70s. So like the 60s and 70s, they like came in with sheetrock and put everything, you know, they blocked off all the old woodwork and stuff and so the renovation, they, they took all that out and restored all the woodwork, and it's just it's this gorgeous building. And so my kids get to have the experience of being there. Um, they get to um, because our our congregation is such that that we have so many young families that are a part of our congregation. You know, they they grow up with Christian friends, and um, through school and so forth, they learn that as well. Um, that they they have other Christian friends, maybe not Lutherans, but they. Uh, start learning how that works. Um, and yet it's still got enough secularism that they get some exposure to that so that they can start asking questions of, of mom and dad, you know, like, you know, why, why is it that people say this? And, you know, what do we say in return? What, what does God's word say? Or how do I as a Christian show love in this kind of situation where somebody's, you know, saying something uh, that's maybe not, not the best thing to say, uh, you know, so it's presented itself with, with good, um, parenting moments where you, you know, you want to teach your children, um, you know, how to be Christians in the midst of a, maybe a culture that maybe isn't outright pagan yet, but, you know, it's got glimmers of it. And and so it's kind of been good in that respect and kind of slowing them into that. And uh, yeah, it's, it's, um, Cheyenne itself is just this neat town because it's got all this stuff because it's the capital it's got the Air Force Base, and it's got different industries now moving in and and so forth, and yet it still is only 60,000 people. Mm. And so it has this kind of uh, townish feel, and yet maybe like 
maybe a suburban type feel, and yet you know it's it's the only, it's the city, but yet it has this kind of suburb type feeling, which is sometimes sometimes real nice. Yeah, how does it feel suburban? What do you mean by that? Well, it means that you know um, you want to go to a store, they've got a store for it. You know, you want to try some new kind of restaurant. Chances are there, there's going to be a kind of a restaurant to take a look at it. So there's no shortage of those kind of things to do without driving down to Colorado or anything. Um, so so shopping's here and those kind of services are here. And, uh, you know, you've got the professionalism of a lot of the people who work in the community. So it just kind of has that suburban, you know, feel where you have a lot of the amenities. And yet, you you know, I live in a neighborhood where, you know, there's, there's no businesses in our neighborhood. It's just houses and people and you know, people walk around and we talk to each other and we, you know, interact and kind of has that kind of feel still. That makes sense. Now let's talk about what are some of the great things to see and do in town. If you had a friend coming to town, what restaurants would you take them to? What activities would you recommend? What would you say, ah, if you're in town, you got to see this? Yeah, so so I'm going to give a plug here for one of my church members because they own a they own a restaurant in town called the Nipa Hut, and this is a, a Filipino restaurant, and uh, and they they just they I, I I was privy to their wonderful food before they started this restaurant a couple of years ago because they would serve for for potlucks and stuff at our congregation, so we would always get to taste all these different things and we'd get invited to their family you know grand huge family festivities and taste this food. So the Nipa Hut is, is the restaurant to go see. It's kind of tucked away on, on just kind of out of the beaten path street. And yet it's this great food and so forth. Um, you know, if I, if I had somebody coming to town, I'd probably take them to uh, a place called the Wyoming Ribbon Chop House because, you know, you, you go to a Western ranch state and what are you going to want to do? You're going to want to have a, a giant steak of, of some kind, you know, and, and they actually have, you know, bison steaks and so forth, and, and which is just great food. Um, and then there's, you know, there's more trendy stuff too. Like, uh, there's like a metropolitan restaurant, they call it. And that's, it's kind of like a, a nicer place, you, you know, wearing a tie is not a bad idea. Um, and yet it has this really just good kind of like the foodie movement food. Um, and yet there's, there's places like, uh, a little Philly, Philly cheesesteak shop, which is, you know, is as close as you can get to, to the kind of cheesesteaks you get out East. And then it's great. And, and, and there's all kinds of wonderful uh, Mexican restaurants and stuff. So there's just all kinds of neat food offerings. Um, and then as far as places to take people, I guess I'd probably see what the people wanted to do. But, you know, you, you typically take them down to the depot to see the trains um, and this beautiful old depot building. You take them by the Capitol so they can see some of that. Um, right next to the Capitol is the Supreme Court building. Right next to that is the big state museum. Uh, so there's just all kinds of those kind of things you can go see if people want to do that. Uh, you can travel west about 25 miles, and you can be in this place called Vitavu, and it's uh, mountains and rocks and hiking and, and just whatever you want to do out there. It's, it's neat stuff um, for that kind of outdoors stuff. Uh, if you're a big trains fan, you know the big boy train that's centered here, and so it's often here. Otherwise, there's a full uh, non-working one that they have on display if you're big into trains. Um, so if you're, if you're able to, you know, you can get on the air force base and you can take a look at all the stuff there and then you can grab, you know, grab your car and head about 30 minutes North of us. And they actually have retrofitted a old cold war era missile silo and, and kind of command center. And so you can go down, you know, 60 or seven, 70 feet underground and see this command center totally restored to, to what it would have been and, and kind of see this kind of Cold War museum, so to speak, right there. Um, and then the biggest thing, of course, is if you come to Cheyenne um, and you want to be want to be the tourist, you come the last week of July and you come and you be a part of Frontier Days. And, and Frontier Days is the, the world's largest outdoor rodeo. Okay, so so our town is normally about 600,000 people. I think that week um, we get about 200,000 visitors. Oh wow! Um, it just it's just it's just massive. You know, you got to plan ahead of time if you if you're gonna stay in a hotel or something. 
Um, so there's these these massive rodeos throughout the day, and then they convert the stadium at night, and they have these huge concerts um, where they get all kinds of top acts. I think Garth Brooks is coming this year because they've got a big anniversary year planned. I think this is the 125th. Uh, yeah, I think it's the 125th uh, Frontier Days, and so they're they're gonna have huge plans for that. You know, they got a big carnival that goes on the same time, and then everything in town kicks up for that. You know, there's just there's parades, and there's um, there's this pancake feed where they feed like fifteen thousand people pancake breakfasts in like you know an hour, <laughs> which is which is just a sight to behold because there's pancakes flying everywhere. You know, as they're cooking them on these giant griddles, and and just all kinds of neat stuff. Uh, people from all over the world that come to it, you know, and and yeah, just kind of brings out the cowboy culture and yet as the years have gone on more and more of just kind of the modern stuff has kind of been a part of it too and so it's kind of it's kind of the big neat festival for for Cheyenne and uh, a really good experience to to take in if you're up to that kind of uh, that kind of thing as far as tourism goes great now let's talk about something that's uh been on people's minds recently, the coronavirus, what's Wyoming's response been like? Has it been more free like South Dakota or more draconian like, say, New York or California? Definitely much more like South Dakota. So um, our governor has tried to be very respectful. Um, sometimes you can tell he in his, his addresses and stuff, he maybe gets pushed a little, pushed a little hard, then, and so he maybe speaks a little harshly and, and really kind of encourages citizens to to do a little more um throughout most of the year we had just very minimal stuff we had a big surge towards the end of the year um which which put some strain on our on our health care uh, hospital and uh, we are through that now and, and since the new year everything's been kind of calming down um you know there was a there was a finally there was a mask mandate i mean individual stores had mandates because their corporate offices were wherever um, but individual, ma- uh, an actual governmental mask mandate came. The first time I think was the end of November, or early December. Okay, and even there, it really wasn't enforced. So, um, so the government has been trying to be respectful. Um, when they've overstepped, they've they've stepped back. So, like there was a time in May, I think it was May, where the government tried to tell the churches how they needed to conduct worship, including, you know, preferred practices for the Lord's Supper. And it wasn't long before the churches had gotten their response to the governor. And the very next time that the orders came out, uh, it was it was all removed. Um, and since then, uh, the government has been incredibly hands off with churches um, and very respectful of churches and the, uh, the free exercise. And so churches, you know, have been free then to just use reason and uh, do what they deemed necessary to maybe help things out. And uh, which has been, which has been very good. So, which, I mean, like I said, it goes back kind of to that, that Western insistence on independence, freedom. Um, you know, you talk to some folks in Wyoming and they think that the government's been too much, too, too heavy handed. Mm-hmm. So, and I will say, you know, we, we haven't been as, as, as we haven't been like South Dakota in every way, but uh, in general, when you compare it to other states, it's far closer to South Dakota than it would be to anything of, of New York, California, any of those states. That's good. Now, as we before we start closing out the podcast, Pastor Sure, I want to make sure to give you the opportunity to point our listeners where you'd like your church's website, places to follow you online. Where would you like to point our listeners? Yeah, well, I mean, uh, best thing would be is if you're if you're coming out this way to, to tour, or you're thinking about moving because maybe your church situation is such, or maybe your uh, state has shown its true colors in this last year, and maybe you just want to go live in a little freer place, that uh, uh, Cheyenne's a good place to, to find yourselves, um, especially in regards to the faith, as we have three good congregations in town. Um, my congregation's website, uh, it's just kind of a basic website, but it's OurSaviorCheyenne.org, and uh, that's where we have just our information. Um, best way to experience any of it is just to come and be a part of it. 
um, as, as we have many folks who are members. And, and now as the end of the year has come, we've seen a, a dramatic increase in visitors and people requesting to be new members and, and so forth. So that's great. Um, and so that, that's kind of where I would point them to is just to come on out. Um, there's just some really, really good things happening in Cheyenne and you bet we're going to be kind of seeing what happens here with the various orders and decrees of the federal government in regards to mining and so forth. But, uh, there's a resiliency that'll, that'll see folks through it out here. And of course, then as Christians, we can add to that confession and say, well, there's more than just resiliency. There's a, there's a God who constantly provides daily bread. And so, uh, whatever it is, uh, whatever kind of government wants to try to do, uh, they can't undo what God does. So, and that's, uh, that's a comfort wherever you live. So, Absolutely. Sure. Yeah. Thank you so much for your time today, Pastor Shear. What are your parting thoughts for our listeners? Well, for your listeners, um, I think it's becoming more and more clear uh, that folks, when they consider where they live and where their kids go to school, as far as sending them off to college and so forth, uh, I think got to revisit the idea of your church. And you got to make sure that you have a good church to live in and be a part of, and that your kids, when they go off to college, that they have a good church that they can be a part of, that as as Christians, as Lutherans, we need to uh, prioritize the church again. And yeah, that means maybe sometimes we might have to actually move. We might actually have to uproot and and so forth. But uh, this is because, of course, the, the, the gospel, the pure treasure, the pure doctrine we have as Lutherans, uh, there's no job. There's no scenery. There's no uh, economic situation that is more important than the pure gospel. And so uh, if, if we're going to make it as this culture slides and so forth, uh, we want to be close and, and connected to that pure gospel, the pure teaching of the word. And so, like I said, I would encourage all your listeners to make sure they, they put their priorities where they should be. And that is to make sure that they have a good Lutheran church to belong to first. And then, then from that point on, consider all the other things like jobs and economies and liberties and so forth. And you, want, you just want to make sure you have a good pastor and a good church to belong to. Absolutely. Thank you again. God's peace. You as well. Thanks for listening to The Lutheran Cartographer. For more about the things that we talked about today, look at the show notes page. You can find that at lutherancartographer.com slash 59. I want to encourage you to check out that free Audible offer that includes that audiobook that you get to keep, even if you decide not to continue with their service. Check it out at lutherancartographer.com slash audible. Make sure you're subscribed to the show on iTunes or on Stitcher or on your podcast app, whatever you use to listen to this podcast. That way you don't miss an episode. And until next time, I'm Nicholas Weber. Thanks for listening. I'll talk to you soon.